introduction of David. This is a fascinating passage as we begin to study today from, of course, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Very interesting. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemp. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV Quick Study, a great program to take you through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation every single year. Corey is here to tell us what she's doing. Corey? I'm looking at a city or a military fortification that overlooked the Valley of Elah where David fought Goliath. All right, very good. That is excellent. And what did you do, Jen? Today we're going to talk about the landscape of life. The landscape of life. I love that. That is excellent. Okay, Ryan is here. And Ryan, what are you doing? Well, today I'm attempting to answer some questions about the account of David and Goliath. In particular, why did David pick up five stones from the brook when he only really needed one? That's a good question. You know, I thought about that a lot. Well, get your Bible out and study. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. First Samuel 17, verses 1 through 18. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Ezekah and Ephes Demon, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armored with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed six hundred shekels, and a shield-bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were greatly dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years, in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shema. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself forty days, morning and evening. Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 1 through 18. You know, there are ways that we might introduce future leaders, and then there is God's way. God shows the reader of 1 Samuel 17 who David was in his actions and his reactions to Goliath and his responses to the king, the King Saul, and the army of Israel. King Saul and Goliath were both men of selfishness, positioned themselves they did as such. David was a young man whose heart was after the Lord God, and he was angered that God and his nation was being insulted. 
Well, the story introduces David to the reader in his first public appearance of strength, a young man accessing the power of God. Remember, as we read earlier in 1 Samuel 16, David had been anointed for kingship of Israel. And God set up this narrative so that, you know, we could read it and understand what it was saying. We learn what the problems were. We learn who God had anointed for the solution to the problem. And that problem would come now with Goliath. Now, this is very interesting as we consider what God is telling us today. So my encouragement to you is to get your Bible guide out and begin to turn to the pages today that we are focused on as we look at the introduction to David. The introduction to David. Here's the Bible guide, and I would encourage you to get a hold of yours. Use the addresses at the bottom of the screen, or you can write to, or you can call us, rather, at uh, any of the numbers, and we'd be happy to respond to you. Or you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com. When you go there, click on Donate, make a donation, and any amount will be happy to send it to you. You know, today in our scripture, as we read this particular passage, I find this absolutely fascinating fascinating because God is speaking to us. We're going to read 1 Samuel 17, 1 to 18. And before we do, let's pray and ask the Lord to clear our minds so we can hear what God is saying to us. Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would open our mind that we can see how David approached and how David did things he was doing things differently than the kings of the year, the kings of the day, and all the people thought differently. And I pray, Father, that you would help us today think differently than the society and the culture of our world. Help us to understand what you're saying to us in Jesus' wonderful name. And we said together, amen. Now let's go to the scripture and let's consider what God is saying to us. This is very important. First Samuel chapter 17, verse one through 11. Now the Philistines had gathered their armies together to battle and they were gathered at Sokoth, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Sokoth and Azkah in Ephraim's Damum. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle against, or battle array against the Philistines. Now the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side. Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley in between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines and his name was Goliath. He was from Gath whose height, this is amazing, his height was six cubits at a span, very tall. And he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had a bronze armor on his leg and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shine or a shield bearer went before him. And then he stood and he cried out to the armies of Israel. And he said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle against us? I am, am I not a Philistine? And you, the servants of Saul, choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. And if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines and the, said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Well, when Saul and all of Israel heard these words, the words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid, fear. Fear was there. See, Goliath was set to taunt Israel and build fear. And the fear of who they were as a nation was the key component to the enemy's message. The enemy always designs fear for us. He wants us to be afraid. And that's really interesting because fear is a very powerful motivator. I mean, fear can motivate you to do a lot of things. If you think about it, 
But God says, do not fear, have faith, for the just shall live by faith. What does that mean? Well, for the answer to that, we have to go back to the scripture. Let's go back. This is 1 Samuel 17, verses 12 to 15. It says, now David was the son of that Ephraimite of Bethlehem of Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. And the three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul in battle. The names of his three sons who went to battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Now, this is interesting because we learn something here. David was not involved in Saul's army. See, God had training in a different way for David. He was a shepherd watching over the sheep. Now, God's training is always different than man's training, always. This is something we need to understand. Man's training or the training of formal uh, institutionalized Bible schools or, or seminaries, or, it's not necessarily, not necessarily, it could be, but it's not necessarily the training of God. Beloved, we need to understand that. God trains us differently. Now, let's go back to the scripture because this gets even better. Here is 1 Samuel 17, verse 16 to 18. And the Philistine drew near the and presented himself 40 days, mornings and evenings. And then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these 10 loaves and run to your brother's camp and carry these 10 cheeses to the captain of the thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring back the news of them. Now, you know the story, but this is very interesting. David was a messenger to his father. God always gets us involved <laughs> in unusual ways. David became involved because someone had to answer Goliath. Someone had to answer Goliath. And I'll tell you something, the result is obvious. I think everybody knows the story. David was a shepherd and he tried on Saul's armor and it didn't work. He said, I'm just gonna go out there with my sling. He picks up rocks, plural, and he goes out there. Why did he pick up five? Well, we'll talk about that later. But the idea is that David succeeded in defeating Goliath because God had called David. See, God trains us differently, beloved. God trains us so that we are ready to speak his message. That's very important. We need to hear that today. Even if we don't believe in Jesus Christ, we need to understand that God is different. He's not the same old cultural God. He is the God of everything. This is very important for us to hear and understand today. As we continue on in our Bible discovery, we find ourselves in 1 Samuel chapter 17 through 19. And specifically, I want to study chapter 17 today. See, here we read about the famous account of the young shepherd boy, David, killing the Philistine giant Goliath with nothing more than a rock from a sling. It's a fantastic and an absolutely true story. But have you ever noted the number of stones that David picked up? Though he only needed one, he actually picked up five. Why? Well, let's look at some possible answers. In 1 Samuel 17 is recorded one of the most famous stories in all of the Bible, David and Goliath. In this chapter, we find Israel in the midst of battle with their sworn enemy, the Philistines. The Philistine giant Goliath, who is called in Hebrew, the man between the two hosts, speaks much against Israel and their God, saying, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. I defy the armies of Israel this day. 
give me a man that we may fight together. The shepherd boy, David, who is only there on a resupply mission, hears the words of the giant and becomes greatly annoyed, asking who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God. Then, in an amazing act of faith, David volunteers himself to kill this giant, who is probably well over nine feet in height. However, rather than coming to battle with armor and a sword, the Bible reports that he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand. David then battles the Philistine and slings one stone so hard that it not only strikes Goliath in the forehead, but it sinks into it. The giant was dead. A notable mystery here is why David took five stones when he only needed one. Many Bible commentaries suggest that David was worried that he might miss. However, this seems rather inconsistent with David's character, since he was a man of incredible faith who trusted in God with all of his heart. Furthermore, he was an accomplished shepherd who knew how to make precise shots with the sling. Another possibility that some have pointed out is that David was not promised that one stone would kill the giant. A third possibility is revealed in 2 Samuel 21, which tells us that the father of Goliath was a giant who had five sons, all of whom fought for the Philistines. Perhaps David was ready to kill all five sons if necessary. Whatever the true reason was, it is clear that David had complete faith in his God. Now, for the critic and the skeptical scholarship out there who don't believe that a rock from a sling could easily kill someone, I need to tell you that I've seen it with my own eyes. I remember very clearly watching a professional slinger hit a replica human skull, and it not only hit the bullseye, but it completely fractured the skull. Consider that David was extremely skilled with the sling since he protected his flock from animals like lions and bears. So God here used the young David to bring down a mighty man of the world. This is a common practice of the Lord. Right now, it's time to hear what Corey's talking about today. Corey? Thanks, Ryan. Today, I'm going to be looking at a very interesting uh, biblical site in modern day Israel. We're going to be taking a look at the ruins of Kerbet Kayatha, a city that was inhabited for a very short time period. Uh, and it was either built by Saul or King David. Take a look. In seven excavation seasons, the small Judean site of Kerbet Kayafa was excavated. It was occupied for only a brief time between 1020 BC and 980 BC, a time attributed to the first and second kings of Israel, Saul and David. Kayafa then is evidence of a capable centralized government in Israel during this early period. Not only that, it's also found on the road that led from the Philistines' city of Gath to Jerusalem. Strategically, this makes a lot of sense. The Bible tells us of all the trouble between Israel and the Philistines during the days of Saul and David. Though Kayafa was small, it was fortified with a 13-foot thick stone wall and uniquely had two fortified gates. These gates, the city's location and date all point to one biblical identification for the city, Shireim which in Hebrew means two gates. Historically, this site would have been witness to one of the most famous biblical events, the fight of David and Goliath. David standing for Israel, Goliath standing for Philistine, fought in the Ela Valley that Kayafa overlooks. Being so close to the Philistine border has caused archeologists to carefully consider who Kayafa belonged to, and the evidence is firmly on the side of Israel. The main entrance faced Jerusalem. No pig bones were found. The style of the wall and pottery were common in Judah, and a now famous early Hebrew inscription was found. It's called the Kayafa Ostrakon, and it's the largest inscription found at the site. It's five lines of proto-Canaanite script have been identified as ancient Hebrew. And though it can't be fully deciphered, this ink on pottery records something in the realm of ethics and justice, piquing the interest of the Bible reader and simultaneously providing evidence for the literacy of early Israel. During the last season of excavation at Kayafa, archaeologists uncovered what they call a palatial building at its very center. This building could have been several stories high and was likely the city's administrative center overlooking the site and boasting a commanding view of the entire Ela Valley.
So there we have Kerbet Kayafa, this extremely interesting archaeological site. Now it really has turned the tables in terms of uh, biblical minimalism versus maximalism. There was this whole movement in the archaeological community um, split over uh, the beginnings of the kingdom of Israel in the Bible. Was the Bible telling the truth or was the Bible trying to make uh, the, the history sound a lot better than it was? Was David even a real person? And, and you know, with the discovery of things like the Tal Dan Stella and the, and the Moabite inscription, Moabite stone that mentioned King David by name as a dynasty founder, the argument became less about is David a real person and more about what, what did Israel look like when David was ruling it? Was there a strong centralized government? Did he really have power? Or was it more uh, still tribal, like, like in the time period of the judges and David was just the first guy who was really, or the second guy who was really trying to gain some ground and centralize the government. But with the archaeology of Kerbet Kayafa being such a unique site, it has uh, changed that argumentation completely uh, because it is evidence of a very strong, centralized uh, Israelite government at, at, at 1000 BC, right in the middle of uh, David's lifetime when he's supposed to be ruling. So it gives archaeological credence to what the Bible has always said is true. So this is a really neat matchup between archaeology and the Bible. The culture, uh, it, it's interesting because a lot of people have claimed that the Bible mm -hmm. is promoting a certain kind of culture yeah. and it's uh, out there doing it. So when you read just the Bible, you know, you're not interested in history, you're just promoting a culture. Mm -hmm. But the culture is so very different in history that we don't, like our culture today is very different than the culture was back when David was king. Mm -hmm. And so the answer to that question is, and there were different cultures around the world, mm -hmm. you know, and all of that. Even so, within Israel. Well, there of course cultures, there were, yeah. absolutely. I mean, Israel was made up of originally 12 tribes yep. that had come there and Joshua and all that. But it's important for us to recognize that God speaks through every culture. God can speak to every culture and through every culture mm -hmm. if we listen. Mm -hmm. And that's the key to the reading the Bible is to listen to God speak from the Bible yeah. as it is the word of God. Yeah, and, and, and God obviously, we see throughout the Bible this process of him dealing and struggling with Israel and, and with the different people um, as a part of Israel. So we know uh, very obviously with a quick read of the Bible even that God's not endorsing everything in is Israelite culture, ancient Israelite culture or modern Israelite culture. But he chose that people group uh, specifically to use as an example for the rest of the world on, look, God God is a personal God and he's trying to interact with humans and, and, and they were given this tremendous task of recording the scriptures down through time. And it, so it's a really yeah, interesting I, mix that we look, have. Look, I, I totally agree with you. I do. And mm -hmm. it's really interesting. Thank you for the report. Very good. What did you study today? Today I wanted to talk about the landscape of life. As we're reading through this account with David and Goliath, you know, those of us that grew up in the church, David and Goliath was one of those Bible stories that was told and told and retold. And, um, and as an adult and reading the Bible a little bit differently, there's a few things that I picked up differently this time and this year going through it. And calling it the landscape of life, as I looked at the description of where this happened, it struck me. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle. Now the Philistines were the enemy of Israel. So they were gathered at Soko and it gives a, a description of where they are. But in verse three, it says this, the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. So you've got the Philistines here, the Israelites here and a valley in between them. And Goliath, this huge big giant would come down into that valley and yell to the Israelites, taunting them and yelling them, send a man down to me and I'll fight. And there was conditions surrounding this fight. And, uh, he did this. It says in verse 16, the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. That's 80 times. That's 80 times they would have heard from this giant Goliath, this outcry that he was tougher. And if anybody would just come and fight him and here's what the conditions are. And I thought about us in our own lives, how that 
a lot of times we go through what people will call a mountaintop experience where it seems like in life everything is going well and everything is going good and it's easy to praise the Lord when you're when you're up in those times but then there are also those valley those valley times in life where things maybe don't go your way all the time and and I thought how interesting though that the enemy was here and Israel was here and the enemy would come down to the valley to taunt and I thought you know as believers a lot of times we're in that valley that's when the enemy comes to taunt us that's when and, we believe what he says and that's what we believe what he says because we're down in that valley we're listening to that whereas we need to keep ourselves up on that mountain and how do we do that we bring our cares and our concerns to God, knowing that, see, God had never left Israel. And God was not going to allow the Philistines to have that victory. And the only one that kept the proper perspective in that was David, this young shepherd boy that came that wasn't even in that army at that time. But I think it's just a good reminder for each one of us as believers that there are those valley those valley times but if we can keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and keep ourselves focused there then we can have a better perspective we can have God's understanding knowing that he's never leave he's never going to leave us and he's going to help us win that battle win the victory one way or another I think it's important because when you go down to the valley it's easy to listen to the enemy because it you're is. saying yes everything's terrible yep but God has already won the battle through the cross and the resurrection. That's what we need to remember. And we yeah. need to rest in the work that Jesus did in our lives.